There's a heck of a lot of tire pressure monitor systems out there. There are some of the rules that you know apply to all of them. There are some of them that have totally different rules from others. Um, there's various different ways. You know, it seems to me like if anything that uh, Uncle Sam requires these automakers to do, they ought to make it more universal than that so that you don't have to figure it out from one to the next and all that. Um, there are some, uh, this, this guy that I know down here that's got a, a really successful tire store, um, he's got a, uh, a little setup that where he has tire pressure sensor assortment and he's got a little machine uh, that uh, programs them and the uh, the Malco guy, you know the guy that sells hand cleaner, you know that pink hand cleaner and chemicals for shops and all, is the guy he got it from and it works really well. Uh, so you're basically uh, keeping your, uh, you know, he's keeping those customers' uh, tire pressure sensors uh, working. And the aggravating thing about tire pressure sensors to me is uh, there are sometimes you can be very, very careful and not break the sensor when you're breaking the tire down or anything else. And the stupid thing just won't work when you put it back together, you know, put it all back together. And then you got to try to figure out what you can do. Sometimes aftermarket sensors just don't work. Or maybe the, the tool will read the sensor, but the, the, the vehicle system won't uh, approve of it. Um, and I've seen that on other things besides just tire pressure monitor sensors. One time I saw a, a mass airflow sensor on an older GM car. When I was working at the Ford place, I got stuck with working on some old GM car. And I got a mass airflow sensor that came in a white box and put it on there. And it was reading the right uh, Hertz readings and everything else, but it just kept throwing that light on. And I went over to the Chevrolet place and this guy over there that was kind of like my counterpart at the Chevrolet place. He measured everything and he said, well, I guess that this, this system just doesn't like that mass airflow sensor. So I bought a Delco one and put on there and the light went out, you know. Tire pressure monitors kind of like that too. Although they're getting, a, you know, I don't know what the present state of them is, but you know, we would fight with them every now and then. My truck had the ones that were banded to the rim, you know, which I don't even talk a lot about that here, but I had to replace one of mine because it was, uh, the, it had just come apart basically centrifugal force tore it apart and I had to put another one in there. So the sensor basic rule, sensors only transmit, they don't receive when they're on a vehicle. Uh, so basically here you are uh, looking, uh, they're turned on by air pressure and centrifugal force and that kind of thing too. And so, you know, you've, everybody's seen these with the little nut on them and all that. And sometimes it'll be 11 millimeter, sometimes it'll be a 12. Uh, but uh, I'm going to talk about a little bit about that in a minute. Uh, when the TPMS system is in relearn mode and the tool is held next to the tire by the valve stem, the tool excites the transmitting antenna and tickles the sensor to get a response. So it actually does, you know, it actually can do this, uh, it can receive from the tool. And these OTC tools are pretty darn handy. Uh, I had a couple of those when I was at the college. Those OTC tools like that one right there, they will absolutely eat batteries for lunch, though. Uh, you will put. You better keep you some C-cell batteries on hand because you're going to have a time whenever you're not uh, able to do that. There's a bunch of other ones that have them. Some of the Autel tablet scan tools, we had one over at the, uh, at the college, I mean, I'm sorry, at the uh, campus I taught in this other town where there was a, a dual enrollment program going. I would teach half a day there and then go over to the college and teach the other half a day toward the end of my career as a before I retired, but that one, uh, that one, you might be familiar with this, some of you shop owners, the Autel, uh, that one of the Autel tools we had, had TPMS built into it, and that you'd hold a corner of the tablet down to the, uh, and activate the sensors that way, and it was just pretty doggone cool the way that thing, that particular one there worked. Sensors generally have an accelerometer that's activated by movement. When the accelerometer is active, the sensor transmits its info every quarter of a minute, half a minute, or every 60 seconds, or something like that. So it's not a continuous transmission. You might notice that even when you're airing the tires up on the vehicle, and if you use the, uh, if you're in, the, the, the smartest thing, what I learned to do, the president of the college drove an Impala that had uh, TPMS on it, and sometimes it, they would have it serviced by the tire 
store in the other town and have the tires rotated. The tire store over in the other town where they had it serviced, not the, not the guy I know that's down here close by, but that tire store would never reset those sensors so that you knew which one was where, which is really easy to do on the GM car. You hold both of the buttons on your fob with the key on until it chirps, and then you use your tire pressure monitor uh, tool to go for left front, right front, right rear, you know, left rear, you know, and it honks the horn every time when it sees it and that kind of thing. And what he would notice, he was always watching his tire pressure. I like to use the tire pressure gauge on the dash to air up the tires so that I can make sure that they're all matching because some customers are a stickler about looking at those tire pressure readings and they want to make sure that they're all exactly the same. And if one was 31 and the other was 34, you know, and all that, he would get a little, you know, put out by that. So if you just use your, if you use your, uh, the, the uh, air pressure gauge you've got in your pocket, tire pressure gauge, or or the one you get got laying in your, on your in your toolbox, uh, you might have readings that are a pound or two off from what the actual system is reading on that. Um, Chrysler had a really interesting setup with theirs. Uh, they had a receiver in each wheel well on some of their vehicles, except for one wheel well, and so every time you rotated the tires, it automatically knew which tire was in which wheel well. Um, and the fourth one, it didn't need one in that fourth one because it knew where the other three were, so that had to have been the only one left. Um, I don't remember what year model that was. Some of the earlier Fords, like on the Windstars and stuff, um, had a the tire pressure monitor would measure the rolling speed of the tire because when a tire is not aired up as much, it's going to roll faster. It's, it'll be like a smaller tire. Toyota, even as in 07, some of their little cars they had nothing on them except they had the body uh, computer system measuring the rolling speed of the tires. And so that way they didn't need to know which one was where. Well, on my uh, 07 F-150 uh, and on my Explorer, both of those just turns on a light. So you don't need to know where the, where the sensors are on those. My wife's pickup truck's another matter. Uh, if the tires are ever rotated, those have got to be reset. Anyway. Generally, the sensor doesn't feel motion. It'll go to sleep in 10 to 20 minutes after the car is in park. This is to save the batteries because it's just got a little something like a 2032 uh, button battery in it. On a, on a Nissan's, uh, check the manual for sure, you can ID the sensors like this. Um, now, there's a supposedly on some of, you know, if you look, there's a, a wire you can ground under the dash, but if you've got a scan tool that will talk to it, Navigate the BCM, select ID register uh, under the BCM, adjust the tire pressures to the value shown, 36, 33, 30, and 27. That way, it's expecting the ones in this particular position to have the pressure shown there, and whenever you drive it, it will use those pressures so that it can determine which tire is which, and after you're through, and it tells you that it has learned that, you go back and you set your tire pressures like they're supposed to be. Now when you're remounting the tire, actually I went to, uh, breaking the tire down is what I meant to do first. I got that slide out thing. Uh, whenever you're breaking the tire down with your tool, you're basically going to have that tire pressure monitor sensor, which would be your valve stem. Uh, or, you know, ideally the tire pressure, the ones that's banded to the rim, they're supposed to be lined up with the valve stem, but they, not, they aren't always. Anyway, you break it down with this either here or there. You can either have it at the 12 or that position when you break it down. Because if you happen to break it down where you're lined up with that sucker, you're going to bust it. And you don't want to bust the sensor and you can help it. Even though, like I say, sometimes you'll take all the necessary precautions and you'll still wind up in a situation where the sensor, for some strange reason, doesn't work. And it seemed like when we ever ran into that, it was always on the, the we would be working on the car that belonged to this one lady over that worked at the library over there that didn't trust us anyway. You know, so then it would blow up in our faces. Now, when you're putting a, when you're breaking a tire down, uh, right behind the duck head, just being your duck head, is where you're going to have your sensor. And then, whenever you break it down, you're less likely to mess it up. This is the one that you cannot take the sensor out of. If you can screw that nut off and let it fall in the tire, you need to do that. I'll have a slide on that in a minute. But if you can't do that, and you, if you can determine that you have a, uh, and I'll show you how to do that too, that you've got a one of the rubber uh, stems out of here that's got a tire pressure monitor on it, 
and you, you know you're going to be able you have to do it like this right here so you don't mess up up all right putting it back on make sure that the this is in the front of the duck head when you're putting it back on there and you're not likely to bust it that's if you can absolutely cannot take it out of there and you don't want to disturb it and all that all right so some vehicles might need to be driven a certain distance so the TPS module can match the sensor IDs and location. That's the Chryslers I was talking about. Uh, that's the ones, you know, of course, like I say, the ones that are just looking at rolling speed of the tires. You know, uh, some of those, I guess, will tell you which tire it is. But the long and the short of it is, uh, you, you know, you're just fixing the thing, putting it back together, even after you uh, get done with everything else you got to do. You know, you might have to drive it away before it will learn and before it'll turn the light off. If the sensor has a nut, take it off and let the sensor fall into the tire. You don't want to bust it like this one right here. I don't know how many times I've seen students bust those things. And they cost about between $30 and $50 for a GM one at the parts store. And, you know, Dorman makes those. You know, some people, you know, are hating on Dorman a lot nowadays for some reason. But I would use their stuff and usually I had pretty good luck. Except for that one time we we, we broke that, or no, we didn't break it. We basically, it wouldn't work after we put it back together. We put a doorman in there. It still wouldn't read it. She was in a hurry. She had to go. Anyway, she smack talked us all over the place about that. If the sensor has a rubber stem, break the bead 90 degrees from the stem. I told you about that. Some of the sensors on your, your, more, on your Asian cars may cost $250, like on a Mercedes or BMW or something like that. Most sensors are calibrated to a cold tire pressure for a particular vehicle, but procedures are vehicle specific. All right, and so you'll, you know, actually the, the temperature of the tire is really important too, and the sensor is always measuring that too. If you've had a tire pressure monitor tool and you've checked them, you've seen it give you a temperature. Uh, for each 10 degrees Fahrenheit of ambient temp, tire pressures will change about 2% or about 1 PSI. Tires heat up while driving, which causes the air inside the tires to expand, and the tires should be checked once a month. Now, whenever uh, my wife had these, uh, the, the tires on her, when she was driving the Explorer and the only vehicle I was driving with my pickup truck, it seemed to me like periodically all of her tires would go low the same amount at the same time. Uh, molecular bleed through has got something to do that. The people that put nitrogen in tires say that nitrogen doesn't do that the way, you know, oxygen air tires do. I don't know. I mean, GM's got like three or four reasons why they like to use nitrogen instead of oxygen. And, uh, you know, it's well, one way or another, um, it's always a good idea to keep those tires checked because a tire can be half flat. In other words, if this takes, let's say a tire takes uh, 32 pounds, it can be down to 16 pounds before you can even tell by looking at it that it's low on air. Uh, so, and you can't like goober on Mandy, on uh, Mayberry, on uh, Andy Griffith, you know, he could kick it and tell you it had 32 pounds. <laughs> I used to pretend to do that. But, um, uh, anyway, um, good tire pressure gauge is important. You know, you can get all kinds of cheap, crummy tire pressure gauges. But whatever kind of tire pressure gauge you've got, and it's not a bad idea to have two or three you can check against one another. Because if you ever drop the tire pressure gauge, it doesn't matter if it's one like this, or if it's one that you, it's got the little stem, uh, little gauge, marked gauge that runs out you put in your pocket. If you drop it, you're subject to screw up the calibration of it. And how many times have we dropped stuff out of our pocket and just picked it up and kept using it like that, you know. All right, so what signals from inside the shop can interfere with TPS signals? That's a question. Most tire pressure sensors are activated with a 125 kilohertz signal, but the activation frequency varies from vehicle to vehicle because some require more power to trigger sensor transmission than others. You know, but one way or another, anything that, that lines up with that same kind of, uh, you know, frequency is liable to, to mess it up. So the, the metal can block the signals too, you know, if you've got an issue with that. So what signals from inside the shop can interfere? The last thing here, say 314.9 to 433.92, uh, they communicate via ultra high frequency signal from this, that. So if you got anything that's communicating on that same, you know, frequency, you may have trouble. Now, you're not supposed to reuse the nut, the valve stem, or the washer. But most people pay no attention to that. And there have been a few times whenever we would get a tire in there checking for a, checking uh, for where it was losing air. Um, and, you know, 
a lot of the times what seems like the simplest job that you're going to do, like checking the air pressure in a tire, you know, you, I checked the air pressure in all my tires, or aired them up rather, uh, the other day, and one of them developed a, a valve stem uh, leak after I aired them up. Something got trapped under the little valve stem seal or something down there, and, and, it, and my tire went flat. Uh, I aired up the tires on my truck and my Explorer at the same time, and, uh, you know, Sometime later, both of them wound up with a flat tire. I'm talking about like the next morning. And one of them, the Explorer, had a nail in it. The other one just had a valve still leaking. And so anyway, make sure that you know that. And it, you can get little kits that have these nuts and have those seals uh, and all that. You know, it's not a bad idea if you do a lot of tire work to have those on hand so you can always put a new seal on there every time. And pay attention to the proper torque. You know, you can't just tighten the ever-loving stuffings out of it and expect it to you know, not leak, you can actually create one like that. So how can you tell what you got? You've either got this or you got that. If you got one of these, you notice those look almost exactly the same. Well, what you're going to do, if you can bend it like that, it's a regular rubber, rubber stem. This one right here has got that stiff thing going all the way up through here, and you won't be able to bend it. And so that's how you can tell. All right, so make sure you look at it like that. The sealing grommets are engineered to work at a certain torque. See the bubbles that came out around that one? That was a hard, you know, that wasn't a very good picture, but you get the point. Uh, anything more can cause a seal to leak, and you can damage the nut or the sensor by over tightening it because it's real easy. And I'll tell you something else, these things like to break off. Also, you're supposed to be using a, a valve core that is for this particular valve, I mean, particular type of uh, valve stem, too, not just any of them. All right, TPS, RTPMS sensor able to report the status of their battery life. Some of them yes, some of them no. Your tool will tell you. A lot of the time, temperature changes can affect battery voltage. It will change as the tires warm up. And TPMS batteries got a long life. Sensor doesn't turn on until pressure rises above a certain PSI. And basically, this right here is a potted, so you can't get in there and change the battery. You just got to put another sensor on it. Uh, battery life depends on sample rate, drive cycles, environment, sensor batteries use at 70 to 100,000 miles. They're supposed to anyway, uh, or 7 to 10 years. Now, can the tire type or placard value be changed after if aftermarket tires and wheels are installed? The tire type and the placard value are stored in the TPMS receiver. As calibrations, they can be changed by flash programming on some vehicles. Since the low pressure number is calculated as a percentage of the number that appears on the placard, correcting the values will bring the vehicle back into compliance with the law. All right. All right. Here's the thing. What you got to recognize is if a vehicle comes into your shop with the TPMS operational, it's not allowed to leave with it not operational. Because if it does, you're in breach of the law. Now, if it, I don't think the law addresses, as I remember, if it comes in and it's not working and the customer doesn't want it fixed, you can't force them to fix it, obviously. Uh, just like anything else, you know, you can't, you can't force a repair on them, uh, typically. You know, the caveat to that is one of my previous videos I was talking about. Somebody comes in there and, the, and you uh, raise their vehicle up and your mechanic takes the uh, brakes all apart and you go over there and find out they were put together with duct tape and bailing wire. And the customer says, no, I don't want any repairs. Uh, just put it back together with duct tape and bailing wire and I'll drive it out of here. You better not do that. You better t leave it taken apart and say, get it hauled out of here with a wrecker, but you're not driving it away from here with the duct tape and bailing wire. Either that or fix it right, you know, and see if you can get them, you know, as right as you can fix it with the, all the right hardware so that it's within spec and all that. You know, if a, if a customer wants it put back together wrong, you're still liable even if they sign a waiver. So don't go there. Um, that's just, well, that was a different, I, I got on a rabbit trail, sorry about that. Um, if it's, will a tire pressure sensor fit in my fancy new wheels? Not always. If the valve stem holds it in such a way the motion detection components won't work right, that's another problem. And there's other little problems you can run into it as well on these wheels here. You know, the question might be, you know, I've got, I'll, this guy picked out this particular set of wheels. He's got tire pressure monitor. If I put these wheels on here, the tire pressure monitor is going to be disabled. That's, that's technically illegal. You're not supposed to do that. And it turns in, you get, you get in a sort of a spitting match with the customer sometimes on stuff like that. Uh, but it's not a bad idea to keep that, keep the law printed out on that. And if I'd had more foresight, I'd have basically showed you. But you can look that up.
you know, it's illegal to disable that because this is this is a you know federally mandated safety thing, and it's just really important. Now, sometimes you'll see these little dot dashes right here, or a pressure value of 148 psi displayed after battery disconnect. It's waiting for updated pressure information to be sent from the tire pressure sensors. The display here though indicates a dead sensor uh, that's just not working. And so whenever you see that, you know, and you may see on the dash on some of the GM cars, it'll talk about, it'll throw you a message that's saying a tire pressure sensor, you know, service tire pressure system or something like that. Now, most vehicles, the OBD2 system port can be used for relearning and troubleshooting. And there's just all kinds of stuff you can get for that out there. And uh, there's three basic types of replacements. you got direct replacements. You got programmable sensors. Let's back up and look at the direct replacement. That's OEM. You need to let the TPMS know where they are, but that's all. Now, those are usually the friendliest ones. Usually are the friendliest ones. Uh, now, like I say, the Nissan ones can be a pain, so be aware of that. Uh, programmable sensors are blank and have to be programmed. You're too low to have the capacity to tell the sensor how it's supposed to act, but if you have a sensor that's somewhat active, you know, pay attention to the 333 or the whatever the hertz, you know, the megahertz is. Uh, that old sensor information can be pulled by your tool and written in sometimes. You can clone the sensor occasionally. Universal sensors are programmed to be compatible with many vehicles, but you may have to do a bit of work with your tool to make them work right. This is a short video. I hope it was instructional. Uh, maybe not as much fun as some of my other videos, uh, but this is what I got for you today, and I really appreciate you coming around. Thanks for all y'all do.